Um, somebody already, Lily already mentioned about mentorship and actually today I'm going to be talking about along those lines. In life we actually learn from three main sources. One of them is our mistakes. Mistakes, they teach us a lesson after we get burned. You have PowerPoint over there, you can put it on. Uh, the second people, the second case that we learn from is our mentors. Mentors, they teach us a lesson so we don't get burned. And the third thing that we learn from or the third being that we learn from is our master, the Lord Jesus Christ. But the interesting part is that each person says, I want to learn from Jesus only. But people don't learn from Jesus who reject their pastors, their mentors and their parents. Even the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated that to us. When he was a teenager at the age of 13, he had to listen to his father and only that set him up to listen to his heavenly father to give up his life. If you think that by avoiding your parents, avoiding your pastor, avoiding your home group leader or avoiding your authority, I don't need them, I just need God. Let me tell you something, obeying your earthly authority is far much easier than obeying your heavenly authority. Idea that I'm gonna avoid my parents, avoid my pastor, avoid my home group leader but I just want to obey God. No, what we usually mean is that I want to obey the God I create in my own image and likeness. Now of course that God is easy to obey because that God is you. But the God who created you is not that easy to obey and how he prepares you to obey him is he sets up authorities in your life and you are like Jesus when you submit to them. It positions you to eventually know him more and submit to him more. Can somebody say amen? So it's very important to submit to our authorities. We either learn from mistakes or from mentors or this positions us learn from our master the Lord Jesus Christ. There's many authorities in life. I'm going to just underline three right now. There's the authority of civil authority, the government. There is a wife has an authority over husband and most of you who were here yesterday you received a very encouraging word. I was so happy the pastor said that. I just looked at my wife and I said baby you just need to be helper. You need to be submissive and shut up. <laughs> I'm like we will have a happy marriage and I need to be an emperor, a dictator and a king. <laughs> That's what I got out of pastor's message yesterday. It was a good message. I think all the men felt like finally somebody said the truth. <laughs> I think pastor needs to teach more about marriage in our church. Amen. And uh, so more wives will be submissive and husbands will feel like a royalty. Anyway, so there's mainly three authorities in life and I'm just going to show one from the King David's life, the parental authority. Parental authority are those people in your life that teach, treat you like a kid. David had his father, his father was Jesse and Jesse treated him like a kid. Samuel came into the house to look for a king and Jesse calls all of his sons and doesn't bring David to the, to the table. I mean imagine Pope Francis coming to your house and your parents send you to clean the basement because you're a kid. You don't need to be here. I mean that's kind of offensive. David gets anointed as a king and you would think they, his dad will graduate him says hey son you don't need to do the shepherding. Let, let's hang out in the table. His dad says well since the party is over David go back to the sheep. It's like dad didn't you hear I'm a king? No that doesn't matter to me. You go back to the sheep. David goes works as a musician for Saul and Saul gives him some vacation time and guess what David goes back to do working with the sheep. His dad didn't care he's gonna be a king. He only cared about one thing. You're my kid. I brought you into this world and you're gonna take care of my sheep. See and we all don't like that sometimes as kids but we all need that to develop a character for the destiny God has for us. See all of us we like the authority in our life. The second one the prophetic authority that sees a king in us. But the problem with prophetic authority is that they cannot be your parents. Prophetic authority is the authority like a pastor or like a mentor or sometimes somebody on TV in the book in the podcast who speaks life into you, who tells you who you are, tells you you are righteous. They don't care about the chores you do. They don't care about your finances. They don't care what you do with your girlfriend. They, they only care about one thing, your destiny and we're like man I love that. I want that to be my dad. Well Samuel can't be your dad. David had a Samuel but Samuel was not his friend and it wasn't his father. You need to have a parent who only cares about one thing. Is your room clean? 
How are your grades? When are you coming home? Why didn't you cut the grass? That's the only thing they care about. Not about your Bible reading plan, not about anything else. Are you there at morning prayer? And they care about these kind of a minion things that you're like, you know what? I don't like that. And then you have your home group leader who speaks life, who speaks encouragement into you. You're like, man, why didn't God make my home group leader and my dad into one person? God puts your parent to develop your character but he gives you a Samuel in life to develop your destiny and you need the character to sustain the destiny can somebody say amen Samuel is the one who sees a king inside of you but the problem with Samuel so if you go, go back to the number one parental authority the key to parental authority is to remember God will not bless you based on you having good parents God will bless you based on you having good relationship with the parents you have. Nowhere in the Bible God said he will bless you because you had good parents. Actually people who had good parents usually were messed up kids. You see in the Bible all over kids who had parents who didn't even believe in them, who were harsh on them but because they had a good attitude God blessed them. Don't think having good parents will give you a blessing. It's having a good relationship with the parents God gave you is what blesses your life. Your parents might not be believers. Your parents might not even support you. But your attitude, how you treat them, how you speak to them, how you deal with them makes a big difference. If your parents make mistake and you attack them, or I heard sometimes kids gather together actually physically beat their parents. Complete stupidity. Not realizing God is not going to look at how your parents are doing to bless you. He will look at how you're responding to your parents to determine whether He will bless you or not. The prophetic authority the key here is this the goal is not to stay close to Samuel the goal is to stay close to the course Samuel lays for your life David only meets with Samuel twice once when he anoints him and the other time when David runs from Saul you don't see David and Samuel being buddies you don't see them going for coffee every weekend you don't see Samuel asking him for his sins every every single month you see them meeting only a few times but the Samuel's course for David's life David held on to the rest of his life the benefit of prophetic authority in your life is not being their buddy it's being as close to the instruction they give you for your life you know for me it's my pastor and for me it's other people in my life who I've met maybe twice in my life who prayed and gave me specific instruction and my goal is not to be their best friend my goal is not to go out with them for coffee my goal is to stay as close to the course they give for my life I remember a man who came to our church a very successful and a very famous man and he grew up believing that because he's so successful every church he's gonna go to pastor is gonna be his buddy and when I kind of sensed that I was like oh my goodness you're gonna be set up for a big failure in our church and he was so disappointed because every Sunday night he wanted to have a coffee with our pastor number one pastor wouldn't drink coffee and number two he won't drink it with you he's gonna drink it with the TV watching TV Joshua and not you and I remember he was frustrated he was talking to me because he wanted to be pastor's closest friend you don't become a friend to Samuel you have to be a friend to the course Samuel lays for your life if a pastor gets up and throws a vision and you don't take that vision for your life but you're over there slobbering him and you just want to be his friend listen you missed the whole point he's not your papa he's not your mama and he's not your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your friend he is your prophetic authority stay close to the course he sets for your life can somebody say amen, amen. number three I call him painful authority now painful authority don't, don't look at your husband right now and don't look at your pastor painful authority we all feel like every authority is painful this is not that every authority can be painful but painful authority are those who throw spears at you not correction not rebuke this is not when you know your parents ask you why you're not a morning prayer why you're sleeping all the time or why your tabs on the car are not changed why is your room so dirty you know why are you 27 and you know you keep getting collection letters why are these this is not painful authorities these are those people in David's life like King Saul where he sits there holds a spear and does the spear throwing at David throws a spear right at David and then he chooses a manhunt to kill David for no reason. He fabricates stories. We all in life will come across an authority which might be painful. 
Now there's very powerful key here what David did and I'm going to give you a secret of how to deal with painful authority from the life of David. One, move your head. Number two, don't throw the spear back. Otherwise, if you don't move your head, what does it move your head? It means any accusation you get from the authority that wants to destroy you is not personal. You're not the problem. They are. They are hurting. They are under demonic oppression or maybe they're going through something very difficult and you happen to be close enough for them to spank you. You are not the problem. As long as you deal with painful authority and see that you are the problem, you're not going to move your head. You're going to let whatever they say hit you and once it hits you, you're going to hit them back. The best way to do is to do a check. As painful as it hurts, move your head means recognize, tell yourself, I'm not the problem. They are. Now when you are the problem actually, when there is actually reasons then you cannot use that. But we're talking about when you're not the problem at all. This person had a bad day, came vomited things at you. If you take it personally, you don't move your head, you will be tempted to throw the spear back. Which what will do is it will duplicate their problem inside of you. The very thing you hate, you become. Kids who say, I hate my dad because he drinks. He always comes drunk. He never gives money to us and everything. That hate, because you're taking it personally, it turns into bitterness and resentment. And guess what happens with that child? They either become an alcoholic or become harsh in other way. You become like Saul. We need painful authority. Make sure that we don't become painful authority. God allows painful authority to give you an insurance and guarantee that you and I are not become like that authority to someone else. Amen. We are going to be switching um, now instead of just talking about you need a mentor starting this Sunday. Our words on mentorship is going to be you need to be a mentor because many of you have been ready to be a mentor to someone else. And you no longer just need to hear to be, have a mentor. You need to be a mentor to someone else in Jesus' name. For a few moments that we have left, we're going to, along this line, we're going to talk about home groups. And I'm just going to read right now 1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 6 to 7. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, Come, let us go over to the outposts of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that is in your mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead. I am with you, heart and soul. Oh God, send us those armor bearers. I am with you, heart and soul. We are going to talk about when kings go into caves. God doesn't want us to be kings who hide in caves. He wants us to be kings who win wars, who accomplish things for God, who have a spoil, who have testimonies of people we brought in the kingdom, people that we've healed through the name of Christ, demons we've expelled through the power of the Holy Spirit. I want us to underline the first thought out of here is Jonathan had a clear-cut vision. Jonathan knew exactly what he was supposed to do. He didn't know exactly how to get it done but he knew what he was supposed to do. His vision was simple. Defeat the Philistines. Rescue the people and defeat the Philistines. It's important that your life has a clear-cut vision. In that vision you must understand what God expects of you and in that vision you must understand a realm of the spiritual. A realm that is not visible. You must have a clear-cut image of the enemy and you have a clear-cut image of people in bondage to that enemy. We have many people today who don't know what they're supposed to do. And many people who ask God, what does God want me to do? And when they think of that, they expect this some kind of a supernatural revelation. Like somehow God will give him something unique and something particular. But it is very foolish to stand in front of a green light on a traffic light on road 68 and Argent and call department of transportation and ask them what should I do? It is foolish to do that because the green light in front of you 
does not give you it cancels all your excuses and reasons to call department of transportation to find out what you should do God in the Bible made it very clear and simple so clear a child can understand go into all the world and make disciples of all nations Jesus has given you the green light to do two things bring people to Jesus and disciple them help them to grow in Jesus there is no need to ask God at least once what am I supposed to do for you on this earth bring people to Jesus and disciple them in the Lord Jesus Christ every person in the church is called to do that the same way as every person on the traffic light is given the green light from the secretary of transportation to go when you have a green light Jesus has given you green light your mission has to be clear your mission is not just well I want to grow a tree build a house buy myself a Bentley and then raise a good family I want to be an outstanding citizen travel to Hawaii I want to redeem my air miles my air miles oh Jesus my air miles that mission that's not mission that's ambition and that's not in the Bible all of that is good to keep secondary but your mission has to be clear bring people to Jesus and disciple them whether I am a pastor with a microphone whether I am a person behind a soundboard or a photographer or a person who edits videos from the back to the front you might not be able to do that today you might not be able to disciple somebody because you just came to church you need discipling but even as you're getting discipling you have to begin to see and know your mission next year in three months in two months you have to be discipling someone else otherwise you are rejecting what Jesus called you to do and you will go to heaven and ask God Jesus you just never made it clear to me what I should do and Jesus says did you read English yes did you have an English Bible? Yes. Which part of go did you not understand? Go, G or O? Which part of make disciples you didn't understand? The make word or the disciples? We have to make it very clear. Mission in our church is every person winning souls and making disciples. It's not my personality. Tell that to Jesus. Actually people who don't have this outgoing evangelistic personality are the most effective. I, I don't know much about God. Most people, Samaritan woman didn't know much about God. Brought all the men she probably flirted with all the way to Jesus and Jesus saved them. Don't ever use that as an excuse. You simply obey Jesus and he will make the rest of it, make it happen. Can somebody say amen? Jonathan had the second one that was very important. Is The second point is second one your reality will live up to your vision your reality will live up to your vision Jonathan had a clear-cut vision but secondly is Jonathan had an audacious faith Jonathan didn't have a prophetic word he didn't have a prayer group that everybody laid their hands on him and said Jonathan go and you will conquer there was no verse in the Bible indicating God will help him. Actually, he was going on the limp on the word, maybe God will save. Maybe God will use me. Maybe. But Jonathan had a very clear-cut vision that they will be defeated. And God, Jonathan had a vision that he will overcome. And that God just helped him to have that faith. It's very important when we have a mission, after the mission, to have a positive vision that is above our reality many people wait upon God in the wrong place it's important to wait upon God in your prayer room so that God in your prayer can lift you up out of the reality you are in and put you into the fantasy world called faith put you into the world called dream and vision so that when you come out of your prayer you come out on the cloud you come out above your reality you come out like a hand that is incubating over eggs sees eggs but knows they, they're gonna be chicken do you come out with faith you come out like Jonathan you come with the reality of that you are above the situation you are in see King Saul he didn't wait for God he didn't wait for Samuel instead of waiting for Samuel he went and offered sacrifice illegally 
and then he didn't get the faith from Samuel actually the only thing he got from Samuel is what you did was wrong when you walk out of the prayer with discouragement disappointment that you disobeyed God with shame guilt and condemnation that kind of an attitude you're walking down you're walking bent out you're walking discouraged you're walking nothing is working out you can't fight you will not live responding to God you will live reacting to the devil and Samuel was waiting every day when the Philistines will make a move because he didn't wait on God to lift him to a place of faith where he will receive a prophetic word from Samuel go I'm on your side the only word he got is you crazy man you didn't obey and God is not gonna bless you when your inner spirit is defeated when your inner spirit is not filled with optimism and faith you cannot move in your vision you cannot move in your mission and you can't make a big impact for God I know that personally from my own life ministry people life bills everything has a chance has this way like a vacuumer suck life out of you you begin to think about different problems people have different challenges different families have different people who are fighting a sickness or an addiction you begin to see how a leadership report how one leader didn't have a home group the other leader didn't have a home group for two months already the other leader stopped coming to church and you're aware of so many negative things the next thing that happens is you walk into prayer like this you beaten up and then you keep praying for those things and you walk out from prayer like Saul discouraged defeated and disappointment and then you can't move forward with God you can't advance the mission of God and prayer has to be a place where you come beaten down discouraged saying God I don't like my home group God I don't want to have a home group God people are not changing all of these things you suck in your reality and in prayer Holy Spirit lifts you up and puts you on the cloud like in the airplane he puts you in faith where you see the reality through the lenses of your dream not the dream through the lenses of your reality and God changes your vision and you have faith and then this what happens when you have that kind of faith these problems they look smaller they're still big but they look smaller and you will tackle them with the Holy Spirit without vision we can't have faith without faith we cannot cooperate with the Holy Spirit if you are beaten defeated and inside if you don't see yourself as a home group leader first if you don't see your home group multiplying and growing first if you don't see your child being free first in your mind if the only image in your mind is they are bad they are defeated they, they hurt me so much if that is what you're carrying you are like King Saul wait upon God in prayer until he lifts you out of your painful reality to the pleasurable vision you want to see and then that vision will line up your reality to itself can somebody say amen we always tell our home group leaders make sure your home group is better in your mind than it is in your house the home group in your mind has to be bigger and better than the one you have in your house your daughter has to be better in your mind than the one that is in her room your finances have to be better in your spirit than they are in your wallet your situation it has to be better here before it gets better there the church breaking 200 every single Wednesday has to first happen here before it happens in abuse seeing 50 home group leaders first has to happen here before it happens on the board over there I want to challenge each person right now prayer is not for the sake of prayer prayer is for the sake of the Holy Spirit giving a ladder and saying climb up higher and let's dream together let's change the world you are in don't be stuck in that world don't be chained by that world let's change the world by coming up higher if in prayer you don't dream very soon your prayer will suck life out of you your prayer will become a routine your prayer will become a burden it will be too hard to wake up in the morning it will be too busy life will be too busy but if a prayer becomes an escape into a world of fantasy which is a world of faith which is a world of the Holy Spirit you will look forward to that world it will be like almost please excuse me like a drug almost like you need to get away get a relief where you are in the world where everything is perfect 
where you and the Holy Spirit you paint and brand new reality you come down from that world you're seeing reality is still different here but very soon the world you create with the Holy Spirit will change the world the devil created through sin in your life can somebody say amen vision has to be real you have to live in a vision every growing church in the world today that has over 50,000 members every single one of them lives by this principle people first dream and then they work works without faith are dead just evangelizing just discipling without having a dream it will wear you out it will bring you down but you have to work with the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit is not going to come down to your level you have to come up to his his level is faith his level is the cloud you have to be in the cloud of the Holy Spirit can somebody say amen number three faith is contagious when you get faith other people will get infected Jonathan had faith his armor bearer came up close to him close enough to catch that faith you see a man yawning it affected the big elephant that's exactly what's going to happen if you walk with the dream the people in your home group will catch the dream if you walk with the dream the people you bring will catch that dream you know some of you don't know my brother Andre before he was coming to, when he was coming to church he invited his friend Taylor you don't know but they went to the Goodwill parking lot and smoked weed before they came to church they both infected one another but then when God touched Andre and Andre walked away from weed so did Taylor you know God touched Andre and he received a revelation to be a Nazarite with long hair and dreadlocks so did Taylor <laughs> you see this all the time with people when you are infected with dream people around you will be dreamers have you noticed that David was such a mighty man of valor before he fought Goliath he had an image of them being destroyed and defeated all David's men were not wussies and wimps all David's men killed Goliaths and giants some of these men the Bible says that they would go and they would fight to the degree where a sword would get attached to their hand they would become one with the sword some would attack a lion on a snowy day in the pit without any without anything some will rip this big animals why were they like that because they would hang out around men who infected them with that kind of faith you must understand about faith if you walk with faith you are like a person who has a cold you infect people by just being around you and if you walk with fear and negativity you infect your children with negativity you infect your work with negativity you infect your circumstances with negativity and there will be repercussions protect your faith protect your vision at any cost because you are in danger or infecting that on other people number four get an armor bearer I want to talk specifically right now to people who have been coming to church for some time how this starts for you what is your next step your next step is make it very clear for yourself what is your mission on this earth uh, let me help you it is to win souls and make disciples so step number one is done step number two you need to see yourself you need to get a vision the reason why you need to get a vision is so that you will have motivation for prayer if you pray first but you don't have a vision your prayer very soon you're like I'm too busy don't have time but once you get a vision you start going to prayer where you live in that vision have a vision of yourself start with a small vision for me to have a home group which will have from 10 to 15 people draw that on a piece of paper get a picture from online put it in front of you do something that will help you to remind you and pray for that every day in prayer walk in where you in your house in the living room there's 10 15 people and you are in that home group the moment you get the home group then you increase the vision to having 12 home groups now how do you go from having a vision of starting a home group to actually starting a home group you first start your home group with getting a helper the person that you go to home group where if you go into Martin's home group Ilya's home group Mariana's home group Lana's home group whichever home group you first start with getting an armor bearer it means you look for a person who you can impart that vision and who can share that vision with you this armor bearer doesn't have to be the most talented this armor bearer doesn't have to be the person who knows the more bible this armor bearer has to be a person who is pliable flexible and who is ready to catch the same vision as you if they know so much the bible they can save half of china but they don't want to move a finger to bring a person to christ leave this poor armor bearer to someone else find yourself someone who will say i'm a heart and soul with you 
when you find that armor bearer just one person because the problem with some of the guys here today is that you have 20 guys but you don't have an armor bearer you have to start with an armor bearer start with the helper and then with that helper you begin to conquer in the home group where you go you begin to conquer one person you bring to Christ together and you disciple them second person and when you bring two people to Christ with your helper you are ready to launch your own home group and somebody say amen you are ready to launch home groups after that and then your armor bearer can become a home group leader let's go to the last, last one number five win your victory your victory is to start a home group your victory is to release home groups so have a mission a vision have a faith that infects other people find a helper after this helper begin to bring other people to Jesus Christ and then you have to release a home group you may say well do I have to have a home group to be a person who disciples others no but you if you're going to disciple other people this is what's going to happen you will get a home group because if you're getting follow Jesus 12 people to disciple um, that's already a home group you cannot disciple people without having a home group but home group is for discipleship process and that's what we are all about in our church our church is outgrowing this building really fast without home groups without leaders without people getting out of their blessed assurance Jesus is mine and doing something for the kingdom of God we are not you're not going to be growing we are not going to be growing and thousands of people will go to hell and they'll point their finger at us and say these people got too comfortable that's not going to happen with us, not going to happen in our city, not on our watch. Can somebody say amen?